local ground. Want to proceed on two, three at Alpha? Lumbering off the tarmac and down the taxi strip in preparation for an early morning takeoff and refueling mission is a Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker. For nearly three decades, the KC-135 has served as the centerpiece of the Washington Air National Guard in its role as one of 19 Air Guard refueling wings around the country. The KC-135, however, is just one in a long line of different aircraft flown by the Washington Air Guard during its remarkable history. A history that reaches back to the end of World War I and traces the dynamic evolution of military flight from novelty to a vital component in the defense of freedom around the world. As you're about to discover, the compelling 80-year story of the Washington Air National Guard is about commitment, service to both country and state, and resourcefulness. But beyond that, it's about community and a family of patriots proud to fly with the Ace of Spades, symbol of one of the nation's oldest and most revered Air National Guard units. The date was April 14, 1920. Along with the promise of spring in the air, there were rumors afloat throughout the inland Northwest that the War Department's National Guard Bureau was going to authorize an aviation squadron somewhere in the state of Washington. It seemed that Spokane and its city fathers believed it had a chance to form that unit. With this in mind, the Aviation Committee of the Spokane Chamber of Commerce met to discuss the possibilities. Finally, in the spring of 1924, Spokane's dream of landing a National Guard flying unit would be realized, and all it took was a simple challenge delivered by Adjutant General Maurice Thompson. The deal was, whichever city came up with $10,000 to erect the hangars for the squadron, that would be the town that got the squadron. Well, before the general had gotten on his train and reached his first depot stop on his way back to Washington, D.C., the city fathers um, had pooled together the $10,000 and had sent a telegram to the next uh, train stop. With the $10,000 challenge met and the words, we want the squadron, Spokane was on its way to becoming the home of the Washington Air National Guard. On August 6, 1924, it became official with federal recognition of the 116th Observation Squadron, 41st Division Air Services. The new outfit consisted of 14 officers and 50 enlisted men under the command of 33-year-old World War I veteran, John T. Fancher. Great man. Um, he was cut from the same cloth as, as many of the uh, Air Force fathers, Billy Mitchell, um, Eddie Rickenbacker, Charles Lindbergh all the great aviation pioneers of that time. With the leadership of Major Fancher, the 116th steadily took shape. The first order of business was to construct new hangars on what was originally a municipal golf course, Parkwater Airfield. By March of 1925, the 116th received its first complement of hand-me-down aircraft, three Curtis JN6 Jennies. When we first got our Jennies, they arrived at the railroad depot, but no funds had been set aside to go out, pick them up, and reconstruct them, put oil and gas in them to get them ready to fly. So uh, John Dean and a couple of enlisted men took some crowbars and borrowed some planks from the rail yard and brought them each crate up one by one to the air, airfield and reconstructed them all entirely on their own to get them to fly. The dogged determination of the unit's enlisted men to get the Jennies airborne was an early indication of what the unit called the National Guard Resourcefulness Quotient. It was this unique quality that propelled the 116th forward, both in terms of personnel and aircraft. In less than two years, the unit had established itself as one of the best guard units in the country. In reward for its efforts, the squadron was redesignated as the 116th Observation Squadron, 41st Division Aviation. It was also expanded to include a photo section, medical detachment, and transportation section. In the preceding months, the unit would further distinguish itself by becoming the first National Guard unit in the country to achieve full flight qualifications for every officer in the unit. One of those officers was Lieutenant Buell Feltz. On May 29, 1927, Lieutenant Feltz became the unit's first casualty when following a routine training flight, his plane dropped out of the sky, killing him and a civilian passenger. 
it was a heavy loss, and in commemoration of his sacrifice for his military service, they renamed the field in his honor, and it, and it still holds his name today. Known now as Feltz Field, it didn't take long for the 116th to put Spokane's newly named airfield on the map nationally. In the summer of 1927, just a few months after the unit's first tragedy, Major Fancher made arrangements to fly cross-country to the East Coast. One of his biggest contributions was in 1927. He flew to New York City to talk to the uh, promoters of the uh, national air races back then. His main focus was to get them to hold the air races in Spokane in 1927, and he was very successful in doing that. Sort of a caveat on the way back, um, just to show that how uh, influential Major Fancher was, uh, he stopped by the summer home of then President Calvin Coolidge, and uh, after giving a, a little aerial demonstration, landed and, and was photographed and spoke with the president and invited him to the air races. Although flattered by the invitation, President Coolidge was unable to attend. Yet in September of 1927, the national air races hosted by Spokane at Feltz Field were a big hit. Unfortunately, the high spirits gained from the successful air races didn't last long for the 116th. In the spring of 1928, following a nighttime air show in Wenatchee, which featured the use of crowd-pleasing fluorescent aerial bombs, Major Fancher would fall victim to the unexpected. After the air show was all finished, um, he found out that he still had about three of these aerial aviation bombs left in his cockpit. So he took the three bombs out to an empty, empty field and one by one, he ignited them. The third one, unfortunately, malfunctioned and it exploded in his hand. The result of the explosion was devastating. On April 29, 1928, the Washington Air National Guard's first commander, Major John T. Fancher, was gone. His funeral service was so large that they had to have it at the Masonic Temple, and condolences poured in from everywhere. By the end of the Roaring Twenties, it was clear that a solid foundation for success, shaped by the late Major Fancher, was now in place. Armed with new facilities and better aircraft, the 116th was now ready and eager to fly ever faster into a new decade. The 1930s began with a flurry of activity for the 116th. In addition to a variety of building projects, the unit was also very busy training and getting ready for massive Army air maneuvers to be held in 1931 on the East Coast. The event was to feature hundreds of airplanes, along with the best flying units from around the country. I think at that time, the unit members finally had realized, we don't have anything that represents our unit. So as the legend has it, at a poker game, someone had put down the ace of spades and it was uh, a Lieutenant Harrell who came up with the idea. And he said, why don't we, why don't we use the ace of spades, the, the, the traditional death card? They said, great, but you know, it's kind of plain and as, as legend has it, somebody took a, a bayonet knife and stuck it in the middle of the card and they go there. Now they know we mean business. Besides going to the 1931 air maneuvers with a brand new insignia, the 116th was also eager to bring along Pat, its newly found mascot. Pat was a Boston Pit Bull Terrier owned by Sergeant Milo Benscotter, who packed parachutes for the unit. When visiting the airstrip, Pat would often jump up onto the airplanes, causing damage to their fabric wings. What happened next would earn Pat the nickname Parachuting Pat. Well, Sergeant Benscotter, in an attempt to add reverse psychology, he figured he'd give Pat a ride up in one of the aircraft. First, he fashioned his own special parachute for Pat and took him up to about 10,000 feet. And then he gave Pat the easy ride down. Well, the parachute opened fine, and Pat floated to the ground, and Sergeant Ben Scotter was anxiously waiting to see Pat land and then head for the hills and never go near another aircraft again. Most energetically and joyously for Pat, uh, he immediately, upon touching a uh, pause to the ground, jumped up on the nearest aircraft and uh, continued to, to be an air enthusiast. By the mid-1930s, the 116th had come into its own, complete with a full complement of new airplanes. Out went the O-17, and in came two models of the Douglas O-38. One of the models featured for the first time a closed cockpit. It was in separate O-38s that the unit would suffer the loss of two more flyers, Lieutenant George Hallett and Lieutenant Whitney Close in 1933. 
The tragic loss hit the 116th hard. Yet a year later, the unit's grief turned into elation as the squadron, as well as the entire Spokane community, celebrated the completion of the most modern aircraft hangar in the nation. It was a beautifully well-constructed hangar right from the beginning. It was a brick hangar with wood trusses, uh, the largest in the Spokane area. The expertly designed, it seemed to be overly designed. Throughout the rest of the 1930s, the 116th would distinguish itself through the excellent work of its photo section. One of the unit's new recruits at the time was Lloyd Brunton. Well, they had a hole in the rear cockpit in the open 038B. Uh, and you set your camera over the hole, the photographer and the pilot would have intercom and get over the area they wanted to photograph. One of the probably the biggest accomplishments of the unit back then was uh, photographing the Columbia Gorge Basin, where eventually the largest dam at that time would be built, which was Grand Coulee Dam. Despite the hardships of the Great Depression, the 30s proved to be good for the 116th thanks to its tireless dedication and resourcefulness. In 1939, the unit would finish off the decade in style by welcoming the first monoplane to the flight line and then winning the Sherburne Trophy. This prestigious award was given to the most outstanding Air National Guard unit based on its safety record. No small feat given the dangers of flying at the time. One, one time I took a uh, trip. It wasn't too sharp on uh, procedures for going cross-country flight and uh, had to dress up for these bearskin flying suits. And anyway, we got down to Medford and uh, Oregon. From there, we headed for Sacramento. We hit a rainstorm. Pilot had to fly blind, and except for the radio, the beam that the FAA had. But anyhow, in the process of going through that storm, we lost both aileron struts that connect the upper and lower ailerons. They vibrated and dangled out. And finally, both of them fell off. So we were minus two parts when we got there. <laughs> Entering 1940, the 116th had successfully established itself among its peers as one of the best air guard units in the country. Soon, the rest of the nation would also become aware of the importance of reserve units like the 116th. Well, we were originally um, federally activated in 1940 uh, by President Roosevelt to bolster military forces due to uh, the obvious German and Japanese aggressions that were going on. It was only expected to be a one-year activation in September of 1940, but it soon after December 7, 1941, a lot of unit members who had kissed their wives goodbye and said, I'll be back in a year, didn't get to see them for about six years. By the end of November 1943, the 116th had been deactivated and all 123 members of the unit were reassigned to other air units within the Army Air Corps. The war would prove costly. Many of the former 116th members were killed, while others were prisoners of war who lived to tell their stories. Once the war ended, it wasn't long before former unit members, along with area civic leaders, began working together to reestablish the 116th. Their diligence, along with the unit's reputation, would pay off in February of 1947. It was then that the United States Air Force was established as a separate service, and the Air National Guard, as we know it today, was formed. Within the new Air National Guard, the 142nd Air Defense Wing was created. Under its command would be both the 142nd Fighter Group in Portland, Oregon, as well as the 141st Fighter Group in Spokane, this meant that the historic 116th, along with the additional units in Boise, Idaho and Great Falls, Montana, were now federally activated under the command of the 141st Air Defense Group, headquartered at Feltz Field. After the end of World War II, um, we received the, uh, the workhorse of World War II, the prestigious uh, P-51 Mustang. We'd have a drill weekend and uh, we'd have uh, what they call a kick the tire and light the fire in the first one and off the ramp is the leader and away they'd go and up in the sky and play ch tail chase and a little bit of everything else, <laughs> whatever it was about, but it was fun. 
However, the fun of flying the P-51 Mustang out of Feltz Field was about to end because looming just over the horizon was new, faster technology, the jet. In 1949, it was announced that the 116th would be the first National Guard unit west of the Mississippi to receive jet aircraft, and more specifically, the F-84 Thunderjet. While its arrival was much anticipated, the F-84 would mean significant change for the Washington Air National Guard, including saying goodbye to the place where the 116th had earned its wings, Feltz Field. With the dawn of the jet age and the 1950s, the Washington Air National Guard had a new look, a new feel, and a brand new home, Geiger Field. The move to Geiger was prompted by the need for more room, larger hangars, and more importantly, longer runways to accommodate the jet, particularly the F-84. It was a summer day and you, you didn't know whether you were going to go or not. We used to have a joke going that we had a little bag of sand there. And when you got near the end of the runway, you tripped that little lever and it, the airplane think it was in the overrun and it would fly then. By the end of 1950, the 116th had not only moved to a new location, but had also, without incident, successfully completed the transition to jet aircraft. In recognition of their hard work, the unit was awarded the 1950 Spatz Trophy as the top Air National Guard unit in the country. It also earned them a trip to Europe. On February 1, 1951, as a result of the Korean conflict, the 116th was ordered to active duty. In preparation, the unit received the sleek new F-86 Sabre jet. After four months of training, the unit was ordered to fly to Shepherd's Grove, England. From there, they would be in position to bolster NATO forces in Europe. The mission would cover thousands of miles across the United States, up to Goose Bay, Labrador, and then on to Greenland and Iceland. The final leg of the trip from Iceland to England would prove to be a real test for the pilots of the 116th. I forgot the time zone change. We took off, everything normal, normal, until we got past the point of no return. Oh, the weather just went bad. Instead of 600 scattered, it was 400 overcast and raining. And it was nine o'clock at night, black. Well, I was, in the second flight with Colonel Frost, I was his wingman, and his uh, compass went out. I couldn't see him. We had our lights were on low, and I, Colonel, the switch is just out more than the throttle on the side. It's up, high, I can't see you. I knew he'd be making a big pattern. He found it, and I said, oh, I got you. The successful landing of the 116th marked the first time in aviation history that a full tactical fighter squadron had crossed an ocean. The unit would serve in England for 15 months before being released from active duty in November 1952. Unfortunately, they returned without their airplanes. Thus, despite the reassignment of the 116th as a fighter squadron within the Air Force Aerospace Defense Command, activity for the unit out at Geiger Field was fairly quiet until the arrival of a new jet aircraft in 1955, the F-94 Starfire. Unlike previous fighters, the F-94 not only featured new radar technology, but could be flown day or night. This would mean a significant change in the air defense role of the Washington Air National Guard. We were able to basically uh, stand 24-hour drills and be ready at a moment's notice, day or night, uh, to handle any Soviet aggression. For the next 20 years, under various Defense Command configurations and six different wing commanders, the Washington Air National Guard would fly fighter jets, many with nuclear capability, throughout the rest of the 1950s, 60s, and into the 70s. We had uh, two aircraft, so we had four on alert, uh, day and night, 24 hours a day. Two of them loaded, and two of them for just identification. And if we identified somebody, well, they would send up the hot ones then. We did a lot of scrambles and a lot of checkouts and of course they'd go out over the ocean, the coast, you know, wherever something was, they thought might maybe a unidentified was coming in or whatever the case would be. And uh, we were there to get them if they were. <laughs> we had one time that uh, it was not a practice, this was for real. They feared we had a, a bomber raid coming. 
So we had 17 F-101s loaded, full of weapons, ready to go. And at uh, midnight, they called it off, so we downloaded it, everybody went home. There was only two guard outfits in the whole United States that responded. The other said, no, I can't do that, we're state employees. Uh, baloney, that's what we've been paid for, that's what we trained for. And if they really felt they needed us, we're there, and we did. From 1947 we went to 1976, we went through seven different variants of fighter interceptor aircraft. If you look at it, we were basically retraining a new fighter aircraft every couple of years. So it's a, it's a testament to, to Air National Guard tenacity. I have the utmost respect for, the, for our guard maintenance. I think of myself, I've got over 8,000 hours of uh, flying time. I have never had to shut an engine down. I've never had any problem, and that's all because of guard maintenance and the personal pride that those uh, and the capability that those guys have. While the unit's role in air defense changed very little over the course of two decades, other aspects of the Air Guard had, and most notably the size of the organization. Much of the significant organizational changes occurred in the early 60s when the 141st Fighter Group, of which the 116th was a part, was reorganized and expanded to include additional units and personnel. By 1975, the Washington Air National Guard had proven itself time and time again as one of the best Air National Guard units in the country for both its organizational skills and ability to fly safely. What I consider uh, not necessarily my own major accomplishment, but a major accomplishment of our or the unit's experience with the F-101. We flew 18,000 hours in that airplane over a little over a six year period without a major accident and that I consider to be a real, real accomplishment. However, despite all the achievements and accolades earned by the unit while flying the fighters, the winds of military change by the mid-1970s were blowing strong, strong enough to have a profound impact on the Washington Air National Guard for years to come. It was called the Total Force Concept, a new military philosophy that sought to utilize guard and reserve components to perform daily tasks within the overall force structure. What this meant to the Washington Air National Guard was huge. It would require acceptance of a totally new role, new aircraft, new location, and new command. By the mid-1970s, the 116th was on its way to Fairchild Air Force Base. There, they would become the fifth Air National Guard unit in the country to join the Strategic Air Command as an air refueling wing. It wasn't uh, an easy project to move to Fairchild. They wanted us to move in to existing facilities with the Air Force. And our big concern was that we would lose our unit identity. You need to know you had, had to have an identifiable unit. So based on that philosophy, we finally got facilities built. Besides the logistical challenges related to relocation, as well as the overall expansion of the unit, the most traumatic part of the transition would involve convincing the old fighter pilots of the 116th that flying tankers was a good thing. It was a little difficult for, for the pilots to say goodbye in using modern terms if you drove around a Porsche and enjoyed driving it and then suddenly your Porsche was taken away and you were given a school bus, well, you were a little disheartened. Well, we brought the boss out of the Air National Guard from Washington, D.C. <coughs> Excuse me. He uh, held a little uh, come to Jesus meeting and said, uh, we're going to be big men about this and take the mission on and it's going to be good for the Air National Guard. So we coined a phrase, uh, it may not be fun to fly, but it'll take you where the fun is. Now, I'd been in fighters all my life. And I probably, I'm a, I, guess, I guess I'm a little embarrassed to say I was as traumatized as the others. I would tell you after we got into them and got into the missions that we were flying and saw the importance of them, and we got to the point where, all right, I'm no longer, you know, uh, the red-hot fighter pilot. I was and I, I enjoyed every moment of it, but now I have the, the responsibility of flying this aircraft and flying it well. Obviously, before the unit could prove itself in the air, it needed a quality ride. 
not easy when dealing again with Air Force hand-me-downs. We were getting second-hand bunch of junk that the Air Force wanted to get rid of naturally. And I suppose, hey, that's natural. <laughs> but uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of lemons that it took an awful a lot of work. And uh, I got to give the maintenance boys a lot of credit because uh, when we got through, we had some pretty fine birds. Even though the transition from fighter to tanker was not an easy one, the Washington Air National Guard, in true 116th fashion, used their boundless resourcefulness to get the job done. Today, nearly 30 years after the conversion, everyone agrees the air refueling mission has proven to be a good fit for the Washington Air National Guard, which now is under the Air Mobility Command. The tanker airplane and the mission itself is, a, I think, a great fit uh, for our approach to doing business. Of course, uh, we're a traditional unit, uh, which means that uh, most of our members are, are part-time members. 70% uh, have other jobs downtown and, and are involved in the community. Uh, we have a, a core cadre of 30% who maintain the day-to-day -day operations and uh, provide that continuity. But for uh, a flying mission, uh, a tanker, I think, is probably one of the better fits out there, having, having seen several of the ones. And uh, it's a good weekly flying schedule that has morning and afternoon uh, flights on it. Uh, so, and the flights are, are manageable. Uh, they're between three and four hours on, on average. And uh, it's very doable with, with your employers. Uh, and employers are, are also uh, a key to, to making our operation work. Whether it's responding to natural disasters within the state, or delivering fuel on the global stage in support of our country and the principles of freedom, the Washington Air National Guard, in peacetime or times of war, has always carried out its diverse missions with unflinching valor and distinction. The reason is simple. I think the first thing I would say is it's the people. And, and I realize it's a broad category, but um, there is no place in my life, there's no place that I know of you can get such a diverse group of people. I'm not talking about ethnicity as much as I'm talking about people from different walks of life. They're creative, they're energetic, they really are, uh, they are the best people this country has to offer. I am uh, uh, kept afloat in my position on a sea of extremely talented people and uh, young people who are energized, bright, who want to come in and serve their nation. People coming off active duty who have already served their nation but decide, well, I want to continue to serve, I want to be part of the community and uh, I'll join the Air National Guard to, to do that. I have a, a real admiration for most of them. But, uh, even, even today, the old ones, they're dedicated to the unit. Uh, it's the most active boosters club in the, in the nation. And all those guys are there uh, supporting their units. And I don't think oh, you can ask for anything better than that from, from the old cadre. And I know the mission goes on, and I know these people do their mission. And that's my admiration for them. The dedication continues. It's constant. Looking at today's Washington Air National Guard, it's hard to believe that when it all began in 1924, the 116th was made up of a total of 70 men. Now, eight decades later, the Washington Air National Guard is a fully integrated force featuring over 2,100 quality men and women. And even though today's Air National Guard is closely tied to the active Air Force, it's clear present members, like all those who served before, are extremely proud of their service to the nation as members of the Air Guard unit, born as the 116th and still flying with the Ace of Spades. Well, it means we, as an organization, we're, we're proud of, of the way we accomplished the missions we were given and uh, we were always happy to display that ace of spades. It means pride. It's a sense of comfort, knowing that the unit is there. Been around a long time, and the motto was, let the enemy beware. The old time movies, you know, where they threw the dagger. Let the enemy beware. <laughs> <laughs>